Uh, my presentation will focus on why the life cycle is so important to the beekeeper. The typical cycle is from spring to fall, so we want to know during that time there are old bees dying and new bees coming, so uh, we want to kind of understand what, where our bees are at at any one point in time of the year. Do we have enough foragers uh, at the beginning of the honey flow in the spring? Do we have enough uh, bees as we approach the fall to, you know, it's our goal to have big populations of bees into the fall so that uh, as they die out over the winter, there's enough in there to keep that queen warm and get that hive through the winter. So we can understand that better by understanding the life cycle of a bee, where they're at in their life, and what, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get into those details. And then you can apply these different things that you witness out in the field and going through hive inspections and coming to meetings. I found, you know, I, I've, I've kind of been hooked coming to these meetings because I was in my hives every week, if not every other week. And so I've accumulated a lot of questions. And, you know, these monthly meetings are just timely for me to come to and ask my questions to the people who I think, you know, have the good answers. <clears throat> and so only over time and experience, you'll ultimately determine what seems right for you. Why keep bees? Just a quick thing. Their role in pollination, they're integral to our food production. They're the single most important uh, pollinator out of all the bees. So uh, as we understand they're in trouble, we want to do what we can to protect them. So becoming a beekeeper bolsters those populations. Uh, to start, a start or continue a tradition or hobby, as I said, I got into it with my dad when I was a teenager. I had a couple hives of my own actually and uh, I thought it was just a cool thing to finally do. Um, I have a lot of fruit trees and grapevines, so it made sense to get, to get bees. And I like the idea of the honey. And coincidentally, we, uh, my family, you know, it's a good excuse to get with the wife and the kids and go to farmer's markets together. And that's them down there. <laughs> um, and then and just to have honey for personal sale, farmer's markets, maybe if you're like Gary's, Start a business, but not really. Uh, I did notice that Gary's got a bunch of price tags on all his equipment. If anybody was interested in some, you might hit him up. It's definitely, I've bought a lot of equipment off Gary. It's the best there is, and there's, it's free shipping. <laughs> uh, brief history of bees. Uh, it's vast. It goes back to ancient times. Um, there's no direct evidence when man began to keep bees, but there's numer refer numerous references to bees in the Bible and even earlier writings by people who lived as early as 2400 and even 70 BC. Um, we know that honey was gathered even before that, um, possibly as long as 10,000 years ago. Hunters left records painted on cave walls from hunts searching for animals and plants and food. And so again, when we think about honey hunting versus honey gathering, before there was a hive, before the skeps, honey hunting meant going out and finding honey, possibly destroying the hive and the bees to get the honey. And through developments of uh, that beehive and, and beekeepers, uh, we, you know, we'll go through a brief history of, of some hives. Apis mellifera and the Apis uh, uh, genus. Uh, the bees are actually a subfamily from a larger species called apis. And apis is the characterization of building vertical combs with hexagonal cells constructed bilaterally from, from midrib. So when you think about the foundation that you buy, that's the midrib. And the apis uh, genus of bees build out from that for po storage of pollen, nectar, and the, the rearing of brood. <clears throat> Um, I say apis mellow this, that, or what because there's several different uh, kinds of uh, apis floria is the little honeybee, apis dorsata is the giant honeybee which includes the Africanized breeds, apis serrana is the eastern honeybee, and apis mellifera is the western honeybee or European honeybee, and that is the, the breed that's common here. And the reason this is important is because they've been bred to, to withstand more environments from warmer to colder. So you have this Apis mellifera in, hot, in Hawaii and all the states through the U.S. Whereas when you get over into uh, Africa and Asia, you get into Apis dorsata. So we have a very unique uh, generation of bees. Uh, the other interesting thing about the Apis genus is their ability to cluster, to keep heat through the cold winters. 
and their ability to collect water from the outside of the hive which they bring in for evaporation that creates that heat. So those two characteristics allow the bees to take up uh, residence in odd locations. So when we talk about cutouts, uh, is there a way that we can dim the lights a little bit or turn them off? So the bees take up spaces uh, depending on whether it's warm or cold outside, they have the ability to condition the area in which they live. So they take up residence in the darndest of places as we'll see. <laughs> So we'll spend our time talking about Apis mellifera, includes Buckfast, All-American, Russian, Carniolan, and the most common, Italians. <clears throat> and the Italian bee, if you go out and buy packages, that's typically what you get <clears throat> because of their seemingly lower swarming tendency, uh, fewer queen cells, but as we've all seen, uh, if you don't manage your brood space, they'll fill it up and they'll make queen cells and they will swarm. But uh, so the different breeds tend to have different characteristics that they've studied. But you'll find that as you're collecting swarms from us in the club or somebody's giving you bees from the club, these are kind of just the Indiana biker bees, as we call them. <laughs> that uh, are, you know, if you, bought, if you bought an Italian package of bees from a, a bee supplier, the first time the, the queen goes out and mates with drones from another colony, you're kind of diluting that, that uh, characteristic or that, that uh, breed and um, really what you want are bees that are just tolerant to this area that overwinter and they do good and they, they go through the winter and they come out you know by that time they're you don't really know what they are but they're they're alive and they're they're valuable to you so uh, I just kind of wanted to cover Italians because uh, we kind of want those characteristics as well in the bees that we're trying to create quick history of modern hives and by modern I mean we've had there's hundreds different hundreds of difference of hives that that bees have been kept in from skeps to hives with unmovable combs that normally when you went to get the honey out of them uh, you had to destroy the comb or sometimes in some cases the hive but uh, the most modern hives the first one the leaf or book hive <clears throat> it was the first movable frame hive and was invented in Switzerland in 1789 by Francois Huber. And uh, as you can see, that's exactly how it's set. You just kind of pull a cover off the top and open up this hive the way that you see it here to inspect it. And while Langstroth was probably uh, popularly create, uh, credited with discovering bee space, the discovery had already been implemented in European hives by Johann Gierzon and improved by his colleague August von Berlepsch. And uh, this is the hive that you see at the bottom where these hives minded the 3 8 inch bee space but they still focused on side openings and access. So these were the first uh, hives that you could go through without destroying everything but they were still a little cumbersome. And so that brings us up to the standard Langstroth hive which is the most common hive for modern beekeeping. Uh, Langstroth did credit it credit the other three people that I had mentioned with their bee space discoveries, but it was his hive that fully utilized bee space and created a top opened, fully movable hive. So uh, we'll look at a diagram of the Langstroth hive on the next page. Um, I just want to do this as an interesting quote from uh, Langstroth. Uh, the chief peculiarity in my hives was that they could be removed without enraging the bees. I could dispense with natural swarming and yet multiply colonies with greater rapidity and certainty than by common methods. Feeble colonies could be strengthened and if I suspected that anything was wrong with the hive I could quickly ascertain its true condition and apply the proper remedies. And us as beekeepers as we go through our first year and we're a little, intim little timid and you know I don't want to do anything to, to break anything, well the bees will typically keep uh, take care of themselves but when you go through your hive inspections you're going to look for basic things like are, are there eggs um, which you know if you have real young small eggs which we'll look at here shortly uh, you'll know that a queen just recently laid them so you don't necessarily have to see the queen but we want to see evidence that the queen is laying eggs in the hive as, as little as 24 hours ago so that's where the Langstroth hive brought a lot of value to be able to go in as often you, as you need to and look at your hive, find out what's going on, you know, take notes, and be able to put it back together again with minimal disruption. <clears throat> and uh, here's a basic Langstroth hive. On, you got the bottom board, 
you got the deep first deep super at the bottom. Uh, it could be one or two, sometimes three, depending on the strength of your bees, but that's where all the brood rearing will happen. Sometimes you'll use a queen excluder that you'll hear various discussions of um, in our meetings, but it basically keeps the queen from coming out of the bottom of the hive and going into the honey supers. Then you got the honey supers that uh, they'll store the honey in, and they just have three different types. You got your rounds in there, you know, depending on how people want to keep their honey. And then you got the inner cover and the telescoping cover. So you can quickly pop things off, go all the way down to the bottom, inspect what you need, and put it back together nice and easy. <clears throat> the composition of the colony. The drones are the male bees, no stinger. Their number varies from a few hundred to a few thousand based on your colony strength and the exact subspecies, um, as well as the, the strength of the hive. Uh, they're a louder, <clears throat> hold on a minute, they're louder than a, a regular bee normally. They're kind of intimidating, you know, but no stinger, they're quite harmless. Uh, and their primary job is to just mate with the queen. Excessive drones in a colony could be a sign of trouble, such as laying workers or an unmated queen or even a queenless colony. The queen. To make a queen, the worker larva is fed the royal jelly the entire larval period. It takes only 16 days for a fertilized egg to develop and fully mature into a fully mature emerged queen. The queen actually has the shortest life cycle, believe it or not. The queen, uh, from, from egg to emerge queen, is 16 days. For a worker, it's 21, and for a drone, it's about 24. So the drones are the last ones out, usually in the spring. Um, Again, the queen's primary job is to lay eggs. She can sting, but rarely does, unless it's another queen. She can live three to four years. Easily identified by her longer, more slender abdomen. We often mark our queens so that we can see her easier. Um, she releases a pheromone that lets the colony know that she's there, and, she pre and that pheromone actually prevents the worker bees from developing ovaries of their own. When a colony goes queenless so long, the, the workers can actually develop ovaries, but they'll only lay unfertilized eggs, which are drone bees and are not sufficient. Um, <clears throat> she can choose to fertilize an egg before she lays it, so she can actually intentionally lay a, an unfertilized drone or male egg or a fertilized worker egg. And she couldn't feed herself if her life depended on it. She relies on her, on her the royal attendants to uh, feed her, and actually we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. <clears throat> and then the drone normally appears at the start of the swarming season and begins to appear <coughs> shortly after nectar flow ceases. I noticed that uh, this last year, um, as I was uh, getting out, after I had harvested, no, I'm sorry, after the, the drought started taking effect, you, we saw, saw a lot of dead drones, you know, where the workers were actually thinning them out and kicking them out because after they mate with the queen, uh, there's no uh, real reason to have them around anymore. So as the food supplies get short, they start kicking out the drones right away. Again, their primary function is to fertilize the queen. And I think uh, this is the slide I should have been on when I was talking about easily recognized by their size. I always tell uh, people that I work with to look for the shades. Looks like they just have a pair of shades on their uh, eyes. That their, their eyes seem to go around their whole head. And they are bigger and louder. A lot of uh, new beekeepers often mistake a drone for a queen until you start seeing a, a bunch of them. It wouldn't, it, would be, it wouldn't be uncommon to pull up a frame of bees and just see maybe a drone on it, and depending on the time, maybe three or five drones. Again, maybe more depending on the state of your colony. <clears throat> and then the worker bee. This is the masses of the hive. Uh, they perform all the useful tasks of the hive, the construction and maintenance of the comb, feeding and raising of the brood. They guard, clean, and ventilate the hive. They forage for pollen and nectar and water. And they can live three months to a year. I'm sorry. Uh, three months to a year. Basically, winter bees will live longer. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But uh, the more time the bee spends in the hive, the less they're working their self. And there's actually, a, uh, the brood puts off a pheromone that, again, we'll talk about in a minute, that acts kind of like the fountain of youth. The more the bees are near that brood, the longer they can live. And that kind of could explain why winter bees 
can live for three months or more. Again, as we get as we go through the winter, we want that cluster. All that our only job is to keep that queen warm, so that in the spring she can, or in late February she can begin firing up again. And so uh, we always wondered, you know, if you had just like a handful of bees going into the uh, winter and you're worried, which I have a number of hives that I'm thinking or I'm worried about, but they might surprise you. you come out in the spring and they're all right. Uh, the workers typically forage any time of day in the spring, mornings in the summer, and never when it's raining or cold. In the summer, workers look for nectar first and foremost, but by midday, the sun dries up the flowers. In the spring, it's above all the pollen that they forage for, and neither heat nor cold completely halt that production. Um, the anatomy, I'm not going to talk about all these items, but I just kind of wanted to point out a couple important things. The glands, uh, the hypopharyngeal gland up in the head is uh, the gland that produces uh, the royal jelly. And um, these are the nurse bees. It's important to understand. We're going we're, we're to talk about the nurse bees and the different stages of the bees in a moment. But uh, the nurse bee is the only one to provide that or the royal jelly. And another um, uh, fat or something called uh, vito, vitogelanin. And um, what this does is this kind of programs the hive and we all talk about the, the hive kind of has a systematic way that it works it's all from the nurse bees the, the, the number of nurse bees in your hive kind of dictate how a lot of the, what, what that colony is going to do and um, I'll kind of show this over a couple slides uh, through my presentation uh, there's another gland um, the wax glands underneath their abdomen that's what they're uh, you know they get into a cluster and they heat up and warm up and they uh, put out these wax plates that they'll literally use to build and draw out that comb. And so in order to make wax, you know, they're eating the honey, and they're eating the honey as well. Uh, the, got the gut area, when we talk about feeding sugar to our bees, there's a lot of people that believe, all right. There's a lot of people that believe the uh, sugar can rot their gut or it's just bad for them longer term, you know. Uh, so uh, obviously if they have problems there, I mean they need to be able to hold it while they're inside the hive. If we're going through a really terrible winter and the bees are locked up in their hive, if they don't have healthy guts, they can't hold it as long. And if they can't, you know, if they're, if they're made to hold it too long, then, then, you know, bad health sets in. So we always want to be thinking about, you know, the health of our bees. Um, the poison sac for the stinger, you know, when bee stings you, it uh, pulls out the sac. You'll actually see it there pulsating on your hand. They, they get the stinger out as fast as possible and less venom goes into you. Um, and uh, glands convert pollen, honey, and nectar into these divided gelatin that I was talking about in the royal jelly for many different purposes. Um, here's just another, uh, you notice the pollen brushes on each of their legs. When they move from flower to flower, They'll use those brushes and pop, pack them into the pollen uh, sacks, pollen, let's see, where is that, pollen baskets. And I actually call this one a packer. You know, like they pack it in there as well. I, mean, I have a picture of a bee with some pollen on its leg. Actually, the hairs on their whole body will, uh, you know, as they visit flowers, I mean, I've, you know, in, in a really good ideal weather in the spring you see a bee moving off a certain flower that's real polleny and just dusty and it's just kind of a neat thing to see their whole body is covered with it and that's what makes them the most effective pollinator as we'll see the development stages okay so this is important for new beekeepers as you go into your your uh, hives we're looking for eggs uh, we're primarily eggs we want to know that you know an egg of this size was probably laid 24 to 48 hours ago. It only stays that size, that size for you know, three, maybe four days. And kind of see down here uh, at the bottom, we have a queen worker and a drone. So an egg gets placed. Uh, and actually, we're going to talk about the queen cell on the next page. So we'll only talk about the worker and the drone cells on this page. An egg gets placed. And for a worker, it stays that size for about th up to th day three. And then up to day nine, it turns into different stages of larva, and actually, let's just look here. So, here we go. An egg. And you got the different stages of larva, where you know, and here are the number of days along the top. 
Okay, so notice here's a queen. Uh, queen's down here. She's emerging on the 16th day. And the queen's usually hanging upside down off the side of your frame or off the bottom. So that's why they kind of have the queen cell. And she kind of grows down there and eventually emerges. You got your worker. The queen's putting an egg in there. It, uh, so up to day nine, it's, a, uh, it, it's through different stages of larva. And then after the ninth day, they cap it to where it pupates. And it's literally uh, only capped, well, it's like from day nine, day ten till emergence. Hmm. <clears throat> 21 days in all. So 21 days from this egg, the different stages of the larva, to where she eventually emerges. For a drone, you can kind of look at the similarity. It's an egg for so long, up to three days, up to nine and a half, ten days. It becomes, you know, a larva of that size. It's capped on the tenth day and then 10, from day 10 till emergence, 24 days. And then for the queen, again, she's just got that 16, <clears throat> six, or I'm sorry, 21 day period where she, I'm sorry, 16 days, where she emerges out the bottom. And again, you notice that uh, up here they're packing the royal jelly right there underneath where she'll feed on it. So the, the way that they make a queen is they'll take a regular little egg cell and they'll just pack it into a queen cell or build a queen cell around it and then really jam it with the royal jelly and that's what makes that bee mature and generate faster and give her all the powers that she has. <clears throat> uh, basic anatomy of a flower, um, it's important for us to understand. Uh, we just had a meet, our last meeting, uh, we had somebody come in and talk about pollen processing and he taught us that Pollen is the male part of a flower produced on or in the anther. And this is what the bee comes around and brushes against. And basically bringing the pollen from the anther to the stigma. Pollen from, I guess, this flower too, but di of different flowers. The pollen goes down into the ovaries, makes the plant seed. And um, whether it's a flower or a tree or a blossom of some sort, that's the benefit that we gain from pollination. <clears throat> the salmon is the male part of the flower, the carpel is the female part of the flower. Okay, so let's talk about the worker bee life stages. The worker bee meaning we're talking about all the females that do all the important jobs in the hive. The honeybee colony has an annual cycle from spring to fall. It's less active in the winter. Um, individual bee cycles occur through this colony cycle. That's what I was describing, the, the process of the egg to an emerged bee. There's eggs being laid every day, hopefully, in your colony by the queen. So we want to understand the individual cycle of the individual bees and where we're at during the cycle from spring to fall. For example, as we're building up to that spring honey flow when the locust blossoms come out, we want to have a maximum foraging force. So we're getting out there after winter on the first decent day um, to where we can go and clean out our bottom boards and get our hives ready for the honey flow early in the spring as warm as you know when what's 75 degrees or what, what's the temp, good ideal temperature to get out into your hives? Or above. 60 or above. 60 or above. 60 Jim always ideal. says if he stands out there with the long sleeve shirt and is relatively comfortable it's good enough and that's when we're going to go through and clean <laughs> off the bottom board uh, we're going to look for eggs and I think by that time we want we're going to see them and we want to see them and uh, we want to see a lot of them between you know, then and the next time we get into them before the first locust bloom because when the first locust, the queen will start laying as early as February, <coughs> early February. So we want to understand that because by the first honey flow, um, we want a lot of bees to go out and collect that honey. Uh, so when a bee, a worker bee emerges out of their cell from days one through four, we call them a new bee first four days and days 5 through 12 becomes a nurse bee days 13 through 21 it becomes a middle-aged bee and we're, I'm going to talk about the tasks of each of these bees in a minute <clears throat> so for a middle-aged bee it's approximately nine days and then they become a forager bee and they forage the, the rest of their life um, obviously these are averages and can vary depending on your environment your hive 
temperature, abundance of food, abundance of workers in the colony, health of the colony. Um, new bee jobs, they don't do much. Developmentally immature, these bees can't sting or fly. New bees spend most of the time cleaning, grooming, and being mostly inactive and resting while they develop and prepare to become a nurse bee. Um, again, new bees emerge and take four days to mature into nurses, so it's, it's significant to note this when we, when we refer to nurse bees, which we often do, to play a more critical role. The nurse bees, in addition to the queen pheromone, there's also the brood pheromone I was talking about, acts like a fountain of youth. The closer to the brood pheromone a bee remains, the longer it can live. Nurse bees create and transfer this protonaceous secretion called vitelligenin, which I was describing, that acts as an antioxidant and even affects the behavior of the hive. The nurse bees feed this stuff to influence the hive's division of labor, how the labor is divided up among the worker bees, which we're going to talk about in a minute. They prolong the life of the queen and regulate her behavior at the rate that they feed her this vitelligen. Um, and they affect the foraging behavior of foragers. So again, I'm fascinated by that because as you watch your bees, they're systematic, and, and when they're really doing good, you feel like they're programmed. Uh, young middle-aged bees appear to spend more time on comb building and general colony maintenance, and as they move towards the end of being their middle-aged stage, before they become a forager, um, they spend more time near the entrance, processing, nectar processing, receiving, the you know, when the foragers come in, uh, the bees actually, there are receivers down at the entrance taking that from the foragers and putting it into the cell so the foragers can head back out. Um, and this is an interesting thing. The number of middle-aged bees engaged in the receiving of nectar at the entrance, uh, they must, uh, be, they, they need to be adjusted so that it matches the current foraging rate as the bees are bringing nectar in. And there's a tremble dance that the foragers will produce when they determine that there's too few nectar receivers um, and, they, and that dance serves to recruit more middle-aged bees into nectar receiving. So a middle-aged bee, while they say it's, you know, so many days, um, they might be recruited into a forager earlier based on the needs of the hive. Um, the middle-aged bees must also be able to build the new comb at a rate sufficient to ensure that there's enough space available for incoming nectar. Uh, the, and then the forager bees, once the transition to a forager is made, bees no longer engage with inside the colony tasks. They literally work from sunrise to sundown, gathering the four resources that a colony needs, which is propolis, water, pollen, and nectar. Propolis is created from different saps and things that they get, but uh, they'll, they'll collect these four major things on their trips. And again, that uh, vitelligen that I keep bringing up, when I talk about it programs those bees, they're even affecting when these middle-aged bees turn into foragers, they're even affecting, like, this for, these, these foragers are going to be getting more pollen, and these foragers are going to be getting more nectar. Um, and there's studies that have been done where they're saying the, the ones that are out getting nectar were, were fed less while they were in the colony. So they were kind of shown starvation a little bit. So they're kind of just more inclined to go out and get the nectar. Whereas uh, the bees that uh, weren't, that, that, that were well fed, tend to go out and get the pollen. <clears throat> um, they also act as guard bees when they return from foraging all day uh, and they return to the hive to rest. Foragers literally, they can watch the guard entrance and act as guards with the other in, in colony bees. Um, their wings wear out. Uh, works their flight muscles, and uh, they, they, they last about 500 miles worth of flight. So again, when we talk about the bee being inside the hive more, they tend to live longer because they're not working themselves to death, but also there's that special pheromone coming off the brood that's kind of energizing them. <clears throat> um, and then this, this push-pull phenomenon it kind of describes the... Uh, these, these are the four stages of a worker bee. Um, they come out as uh, new bees and they're cell cleaners. They become nurse bees. They become the middle-aged bees and then foragers. Well, it's natural for the new bees to get pushed into the nurse uh, stage by newly emerging bees, but also the needs of the hive. And then nurses will eventually be recruiting into the middle-aged bees. And you'll notice that 
where I was describing if the foragers determine we need more uh, nectar receivers, they can push those up. There can literally be a bee that was recruited into foraging, but then maybe also say, okay, we're good now, go back and start doing uh, in-hive tasks. So they can adjust the foraging force based on their needs and, and, and the, su the supplies available out. You know, if there's not a lot to collect, then we don't need so foragers. So we're going to put some bees back in the hive and have them focus more on building comb.